Welcome, everyone, to another exciting edition of Michigan Birding 101. Today is our second session of this four-part class. We're so excited that you're all joining us today. Uh, we see a lot of folks back from the first class, so that's good. We didn't scare everyone off. Uh, if you're viewing this online, thanks for watching. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to start today by talking a little bit about backyard birds, what you can expect in your own backyard. So some of our objectives today. Well, this is always our first objective. I hope you're ready to have a little fun. I hope you're curious and ready to ask some questions because we're ready to try to answer them for you. And I, I really hope you're excited to just see cool birds. Um, birds are such an amazing group of species and I'm really excited to have you all here to learn a little bit more about them. Um, one of our, our main goals today is we're going to go through the common backyard feeder birds and we're going to give you some tips on what you can expect in your own backyard. This is a great place to make sure you really have down packed the backyard birds because you're going to see those birds all over the place in other locations. So it's really good to learn those common ones first. Uh, and then we're also going to cover with whatever time we have a little bit about how to feed the birds and how to keep that situation safe to make sure you're feeding safe feeds to your birds uh, in your own backyards. Now, I see a lot of you are already starting to chime in again. It's great to see a lot of you back in the chat. Uh, do remember the chat is open and you can chat with everyone, share your own um, tips about backyard bird feeding or things that you see, share cool facts or uh, useful uh, websites or things like that you know about resources. But if you have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A today. Make sure you put your questions in the Q&A, which is a separate feature on Zoom, um, and that way we won't miss them because uh, the chat is flying with lots of cool stuff. Um, all right, so uh, just a little bit before we dive into the backyard birds, um, just as a reminder, my name's Elliot Nelson, and I'm an extension educator with Michigan Sea Grant. Now, Michigan Sea Grant's goal is to help foster and protect Great Lakes coastal resources and permit, promote coastal economies. So you might be thinking to yourself, what does the Great Lakes have to do um, with anything to do? with birds. How are, how are those two things connected? Why is Sea Grant in this space? And actually, we're not the only state Sea Grant program that deals with birds. Ohio, North Carolina, Texas, many others um, have been involved with this because birds are an essential part of aquatic research resources. For one thing, birds provide many ecosystem services. Um, these seabirds, which nest on island colonies, and we even have our own version of that in the Great Lakes with things like gull colonies on islands, um, they can actually help an island that maybe was flooded recently and had all the soil and nutrients depleted um, be totally restored to life. And you might be thinking, what? Birds on islands poop a lot and they kill the vegetation. And that's true. But when those um, birds are pooping, they're also depositing nutrients. And those nutrients over time build up. And then over time, vegetation can take hold and it can actually help repopulate vegetation on islands. Um, and there are actually many examples of this across the world. Uh, birds are also voracious seed eaters. And so if you've been in a forest lately, look around at the trees and realize that in some forests, up to 90 98% of those seeds are dispersed by birds. So birds are really essential for forest ecosystems. Um, you might also be wondering, you know, uh, what about the bugs that come out of the water? Well, um, that is a really uh, important food source for birds. And birds like swallows can actually really help control nuisance bugs like mosquitoes. A swallow can eat up to 850 mosquitoes in a single day. Um, and so they provide another service in the form of pest control. Um, so birds can provide many services for us and for our ecosystems. Um, birds are also a great indicator of Great Lakes health. Um, so this is a herring gull and this is a study from herring gulls, which is actually the, one of the longest running biomagnification studies in the world. One of the longest running ecosystem studies really and food web studies in the world is right here in the Great Lakes on Green Island, which is right up uh, at the Straits of Mackinac. If you drove over the bridge, there's a big, huge gull colony out there and herring gull eggs are measured each year there to measure the level of contaminants that are in our Great Lakes food web. And has helped us track over time what's happening to these long running chemicals like PCBs. Um, and that's right because of birds in the heart of the Great Lake that we have that better understanding. Now, birds are not just interesting for science of research and ecosystem services. They're also an economic driver. Um, birders in 2011 spent $41 billion on just travel and expenses. This does not count um, 
backyard feeding or anything like this. This is really all just related to trip expenditures. Uh, and so that's a lot of money on trip expenditures and equipment like um, binoculars and such. And that's gone even up way more since 2011. And so a lot of our local economies um, can really benefit from birding tourism and places like Tawas and the Eastern UP in the winter and others um, are really starting to see a little bit of an economic boom from birding. Um, and so that's a little bit about uh, you know, back why why Sea Grant is involved with this? Well, it could become a, an economic asset for coastal communities. It is also essential to keep support healthy bird populations to support a healthy Great Lakes, um, and so that's why we're involved. All right, now back to the backyard birds. So um, Michigan is a wonderful state to go birding. If you are not excited yet to start getting out and, and around our state, um, I hope by the end of this class you will be and, and definitely tune into our last class where we'll be talking about where to go birding in Michigan and even some birding 101 meetups you can join us in. Um, but uh, there are over 450 species, and so that might seem a little overwhelming, right, as you're new to this uh, hobby of birding. 450 is a lot of birds to learn, and that's how many species have been seen in Michigan, species like this white-eared hummingbird. But the thing with this white-eared hummingbird is that it's only been seen once, I believe, ever in the state of Michigan. And so even though we have this checklist with 450 species, many of them are what we call vagrants that got a little lost or something. Uh, and so they, they got off their path and birders found them and documented it. And that's made our checklist really high. But if you really look at how many breeding species we have, well, that's, that's a lot less. And if you know the name of this species, then you might not actually be a beginning birder here. <laughs> um, but this is a, a fabulous species that's actually a, many want to make our, our uh, state bird because it only breeds in the state of Michigan. Um, but it's one of uh, 237 different species that breed in the state of Michigan. I didn't see anyone name this bird yet in the chat. Um, this is a Kirtland's warbler, uh, was, was on the endangered species list, one of the rarest warblers in the world. And it's one of 237 species that breed here. So that's a smaller list, and that's kind of more realistic to what you might see in a year. Um, but still, that's a lot. It still might be overwhelming. Let's look at our backyards, though. And this species is from last week. If you remember the name of the species, throw it in the chat right now. Um, but this is one of our, our backyard bird species that when you start to get into birding, if you start in your backyard, you can really expect more like 10 to 30 species in your backyard. Species like this dark-eyed junco that a number of you have just put in the chat, chat which is awesome. Thanks. Uh, good, good job remembering that from last week. Um, but yeah, this is one of only about 30 or so species that you could expect probably in your own backyard. And that's a lot more manageable. And so that's why if you're new to birding, like this class is designed for, um, then, you know, starting with your back backyard, whether you have a huge backyard with tons of property or you have a small window outside of an apartment, you can find birds everywhere in your own yards and your own where you live. So start there. Um, so let's get into this a little bit. And I do just want to give a quick uh, shout out to all of our more experienced birders that are joining us today. Um, in our registration, about a third of folks actually already feel comfortable with their backyard birds or even our more advanced or intermediate birders. And we're excited that you're joining us today. Hopefully you get something out of this. Um, for our new birders though, know that this is challenging and uh, it can take time to find those. So more experienced birders, let's give the new birders some more time um, uh, when it comes to these ID quizzes and give them a chance. And new birders, don't feel bad if this is too challenging for you because it just takes time. Uh, and in the end, it's all about having fun. So if you can't identify them, but you still get to see them, hey, that's awesome. All right, so let's start with observing this bird. I want you to um, start by, uh, sending me some chats about what you notice about this bird. And this is a review from last week. We're not going to quite review the binoculars from last week, um, but you can always pull them out and give this a little look if you want to practice using your binoculars at the same time. Um, but let's review what are some features that we would try to observe. Um, so we see somebody says white all the way around the eye. That's a great feature, right? Because you can tell that that whole eye is bordered by very pale or white feathers. Black cap, right? A very two-toned pattern there we see. Um, somebody's noticing behavior that it eats seeds. That's a great important thing to note when we're looking at birds, if we can note their food that they're eating. Um, and then somebody noted that they have a very unique posture. Trinity says that it leans forward, right? Um, so it has quite a unique um, body shape there. 
that makes it a really different kind of structure. These are all great observations, and this is what you should be doing when you first see a bird. Remember, keep your eyes on the bird as long as possible, and then try to note as many of these structures, patterns, relative size. Be wary of color, be wary of words like small or big, right? We wanna compare that bird to itself or to known size structures. Um, I like too, that bluish, steely bluish on the back. So these are all great features for this bird. And if you're not familiar, this bird is a, a type of bird we call a nuthatch. So if you open up your book to the nuthatches, and I see a few po folks are already eager to take a guess, um, but if you open up your books to the nuthatch section, you'll see we have a couple of possible species in Michigan. And now our guesses are coming in that this is a white-breasted nuthatch, which is great. Uh, and so that would be your last step. After you observe and take all those observations, like the beak size and the shape, then you write some of those down, like we did here, and then you would open up the field guide. Get to the white-breasted nuthatch, which is one of our first group of backyard birds. So uh, the one of the, my favorite groups are what I call the cute ones. And just to give you a little warning, I'm grouping up the birds by my own grouping system. <laughs> um, now I'm trying to use somewhat similar groups. Um, these are a lot of the, uh, what we call the tit family here, but um, I am going to be using a little loosey goosey terms here, um, but I think these are helpful ways to remember the backyard birds. So the cute ones um, are birds that we're going to have year round. And these are the chickadees, the tit mice, and the nuthatches. They're going to be some of your most common birds. Um, unless you're in a really urban area, most likely you will have some of these birds. Um, the tufted tit mouse is not normally found in the upper peninsula. Um, so that's kind of unique to the lower peninsula, but all these other birds can be found statewide. Now, um, all these birds are small and they're seed eaters, um, but they're gonna be some of your most common ones. So the black cap chickadee is, is probably my favorite species in the world. It's an amazing bird, it's super friendly. It'll eat out of your hand, um, but it's related very closely to the tufted titmouse, which actually sounds very similar in a lot of its vocalizations, but has that unique crest. Um, the nuthatches are these very long bodied birds that have a almost woodpecker-like posture, but their bodies are almost always held horizontal. And you can see they're pretty easy to differentiate with one having that black eye stripe versus the white, and then the one having the red breast instead of the white breast. They're actually named in a helpful way, unlike our, a lot of our other birds. <laughs> the brown creeper is another common bird. They will come to feeders to eat suet sometimes, um, but they are hard to see because as you can tell, they blend right in. But anyway, these are our cute ones. And so this is the first group that I would really recommend that you start, um, you know, studying a little bit in your in your field guides. Hopefully you've been able to acquire one or will shortly uh, and start getting a little uh, practice with those in your backyard. Hopefully you get a few of those. All right, here's another one. Let's not say the name of this species yet. Let's not say the name of the species, um, but let's start with some observations. What are some things you notice about this bird? And this bird is an, uh, one of a new group um, that we'll get to in just a second. That's a lot more variable and that m more often shows up in the winter. Um, but let's see, what are some things you notice about this? First off, it's perched. It's a perching bird, which actually helps us put it in the big group of passerines or perching birds. It has a little yellow on the throat, maybe a little yellow on the back, um, kind of these patches of yellow. We're so noticing kind of patchy or collared yellow. Um, so that's those are some great observations. Oops, sorry. Um, it's got short wings compared to its body. That's a really helpful observation. And it's wings, which um, the wings are the primary feathers here, they don't extend past the tail. Um, and so they're they're pretty short wings. It has a couple of very clear wing bars, and that's really going to be helpful too. Um, I've also, I'm seeing maybe a few people, not too many though, noting um, the bill here. The bill is a lot more robust in terms of its thickness, um, and it it is not super long, right? So this is a, more of a chunky bill, and this is one of the key features for this group of species. Uh, yes, that bill helps it really eat nuts and seeds, um, and this group really uh, specializes a lot of times in cones or uh, catkins or things like that. And it has some gray too and a fluffy belly. So those are a lot of great observations. And if, um, 
if you know your birds already a little bit, you might know that this falls into the finches. So this is a finch. And actually, if you uh, have a guess, go ahead and throw that in which finch this might be here. This finch looks a lot different in the summer, I will say. And you might have known it if I gave you the summer plumage. Um, but uh, we've got our first guess there, which is the goldfinch, and that is correct. So this is part of the finches, what I call the big beaks. And this is actually a, a group of species together. Um, and these are a lot more variable. And so you might have these some years and other years, they might be completely absent. Some years you might have them year round and other years you might only have them for a week in the fall or two months in the winter. Um, they're very eruptive that we call them. Um, but the first two, um, well, they're probably some of the more common ones. The American goldfinch, it's a bright yellow color in the summer. The males are especially, the females stay kind of looking like this year round, uh, but they are one of our more common finches in the state of Michigan. Um, the pine siskin is a lot less common, but some years they erupt. And this year I've had 50 pine siskins at my feeder every single day uh, this winter, where some years I don't see them at all in the winter. Um, so very a lot more eruptive. They look similar, but they have a lot more streaks on their bodies. And then um, another species or two species are actually the red poles. Now these you have to get quite lucky to see. They're not nearly as common, um, but they have a nice red uh, palette on the top of their head. And if you have feeders out right now, keep an eye. They're starting to migrate and move around. Uh, and so there are two species at this time, although they may lump them into one. One that's a lot more pale, the hoary red pole, and one that has a lot more streaks, the common red pole. Um, but that red kind of cap is a good indicator there on a streaky bird. Um, the last two are the house finch and the purple finch. Now these two are really a little tough to differentiate. Uh, the house finch has a curve in its colman or the bill kind of border there, although you have to be really close to see that. Um, the purple finch, at least the males, have purplish color that goes all the way down to the back. The colors are different, but if you don't have them side by side, it, I would not rely on the, uh, the rosy red versus the purplish red. It's kind of hard to differentiate without them side by side. But the males, house finches have a lot of streaks on their side, whereas the purple finches have more of it washed out. So those are a little, you can use your bird books to kind of keep helping you if you have those two. The house finch is much more common, found year round. It's actually a kind of a non-native-ish species. Um, and the purple finch is a little more common in the northern parts of Michigan, um, is, is a bit more rare downstate in the lower peninsula. In, especially in the southern lore. So that is the uh, the finches. And I see that Dennis and Dolly had red poles in the past, uh, but this year it's it's siskins and they are voracious eaters. They are definitely big time seed eaters that are gonna just chow down on the seeds. Um, and if you are lucky to get those big flocks, like the big flocks of pine siskins or the red poles, enjoy them while they're there. Cause just like um, our folks in the chat are sharing about, uh, you know, it's not always every year you're going to get those. So enjoy them the years you do. Oh, Miriam had red poles today too. That's awesome. All right. So let's move on. This is another um, conundrum and it's going to set up our next group, the hardheads or AKA the woodpeckers. And these are two of our most common woodpecker species in Michigan. So I want to give a quick second. If you have your bird books, open them up to the woodpecker section. And these two species are a hairy and a downy woodpecker. And I want you to look at the uh, bird book. Don't say the names yet. Give it a guess or don't give your guesses quite yet. I want to give folks a second. If you have your bird books nearby, open them up and try to look at what some of the differences are between the hairy and the downy woodpecker. So if you find some of those differences, go ahead and put those in the chat, um, but look at your bird books and see if you can find the differences. I'm gonna grab mine too, just so I can be a, a part of this. <laughs> All right, I got my, my bird guide here, flip into the woodpecker section. Now, some of the differences, one of them in particular that uh, oh, three feet, three people just put in there is the bill length. And you can note this bird has a bill that's about the length of its own head, right? Uh, bird A has a bill that's the length of its own head, whereas bird B has a bill that's about half the length of its head. Uh, and so that is one of those relative comparisons that you can do. Even if you don't have these two birds side by side, you can compare the bill length to the bird's own head. So that's a really helpful feature on the differentiating these two. And then the other one, yes, body size is different, but 
the smallest hairy woodpecker and the largest downy woodpecker can overlap almost in size. It's not very common, but the, you can have runt sized hairy woodpeckers and large downy woodpeckers. And so size can be really tough unless, again, unless you have them side by side. Um, their, their vocalizations are different. So that's a really um, good note. If you have uh, the bird Merlin app, you can play the two calls and compare those. They're subtly different, but they're different. And the last one is, is not used by birders too often because the bill is just really easy. But this bird has uh, a little bit of black flecks in the white outer tail feathers, whereas this bird has pure white outer tail feathers. Um, you know, it's a subtle feature. The bill really is where you want to focus on this. So give it your guess. What is bird A and what is bird B? If you've got your books um, and, and you can tell which one's bigger and which one's smaller, um, go ahead, give it, give it the, the guess. Oh, Debbie says that the downy has the spots on the wing and A is the hairy because it has no spots or no spots on the tail, rather. Sorry, spots on the tail. So, yes, the hairy is bird A. It is the larger of these two species. And downy is bird B, the smaller. But again, using those bill lengths will really help you out. Um, so that's probably the hardest identification in the woodpeckers that are going to be in your backyard. The rest of the woodpeckers look pretty different. And these are the other hardheads, as I call this group. Um, and there is a, a large variety. These are the ones that you could probably find statewide almost year round. The northern flicker is a very unique woodpecker that this one actually feeds on the ground and eats ants a lot of time and other bugs off the ground. Um, less likely to be pecking at a tree, but you will find them at your feeders. They also eat seeds. Um, hairy woodpeckers and downy woodpeckers, they love suet and there's some of them are more common if you're lucky enough to see the pileated it's like the size of a crow or a, a small chicken so you'll know it it's way bigger than the other woodpeckers and then the red-bellied woodpecker which i guess has a red belly but that's just a poorly named bird <laughs> i wish they would change that one it's got a little reddish wash that you can almost never see unless you have the bird in your hand and only in the brand new bright breeding plumage it's a horribly named bird most people call it the red-headed woodpecker, which this is not. Red-headed woodpeckers are found in Michigan. They're a little less common, so I don't have them on here. But if you're lucky enough to get those, they have a completely red head on both front and back of their head. So that's the hard heads. And I'm seeing that some of you are noting they also love peanuts. Yes, that's good. That'll come into play in a little bit when we get to our... Um, when we get to our feeding, um, peanuts could be a good one, especially red belly. They love those. Um, and yeah, the woodpeckers are just some of the most fabulous birds out there. A good reason to leave some dead trees if you own property and have woods. Um, those dead trees become really important for uh, woodpeckers. Uh, all right. The next one, I'm not going to do a little quiz here because these ones are our larger passerines. That would be the, the perching birds. And these are the chunky folks. These are the big bright, colorful, uh, gregarious birds that sometimes mob your feeders, like the blue jays. Now, I, I hear a lot of hate from blue jays sometimes because people are like, they mob my feeder, they scare away my pretty little birds. Um, and, and I get that. They can be a little obnoxious. But look at that bird. I mean, it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. It has big blue crest and these bright, brilliant wings. And they are so smart. They can get into all unique kind of foods that you leave out. They're also really diverse eaters. Um, and so if you have too many of them or if you if they're if they're scaring away your birds from your black oil sunflowers, try a little corn for the blue jays. They like corn and they like peanuts a lot. Um, another really um, a big, beautiful crested bird is our northern cardinal. Um, the males and females look a little bit different, so that might be one thing if you're new to birding to note. Um, but they, again, are pretty unique with that bright red bill and that big crest. So hopefully you can get that one down pretty quick. And then I put this on here, even though it's not that often a feeder bird, it is a very common yard bird because they like to feed on bare grass areas. One of the only birds that uh, we have in Michigan that do okay with um, lawn grass, and that would be the American robin. Um, do note that the juvenile birds for a month in June or so have spots on their breasts, which is one of my spark birds they talked about last week um, was a juvenile robin. But most of the time, they're pretty unique. So these are some of our larger birds. And then last but not least, this one's a little more subtle, a little less bright colored, maybe a little less uh, going on in the brain category. They have pretty small brains. <laughs> um, but, you know, they are still another beautiful, amazing bird, the morning dove. And actually, take a look next time you see a morning dove uh, on the back of their necks. They actually have an iridescent purple patch there that just really, if you can get the sun on it, just 
bright lights up and also their eye ring in the breeding season is this beautiful pale blue so beauty to be found in every one of these backyard birds and these are large ones that now that you've seen them you're probably like oh yeah i think i do know birds <laughs> you know you probably know these four already and if not, don't worry, they're not too hard to learn. All right, look, moving on here so we can get to our bird feeding here in just a bit. Um, and I do hear that, oh yes, um, you're right. You can get some of these birds that are less likely to eat seeds to come to mealworm fever feeders. Um, Nancy shared that uh, she has robins coming to her mealworm feeder every day. And bluebirds are another one that do really well from mealworms. Um, so I don't have bluebirds on here, but they can be a backyard uh, bird, especially if you have mealworms, they'll come to your feeders. And morning doves, yeah, they are really a, just a beautiful bird named after that, that mournful call they make. All right. Now, the next one group of birds we got here are the boys of summer. And I say that because the boys are the bright colored ones here. Mm -hmm. um, but these are our passerines or songbirds that migrate. And so none of these you would expect to see in the winter. If you do, that's very unusual. Tell someone about it. Um, <laughs> but these will start showing up in May and be around till early September or so. And they will come to feeders. Um, the Baltimore Oriole is our most common Oriole species. And they love the jelly feeders and, uh, and, and the humming bird feeders and they're a bright orange so again not too hard although the females can throw you for a loop they almost sometimes can trick you to be a warbler or something um, but they're a little bit bigger and they do have that nice uh, blackbird style bill because they're actually related closely to blackbirds um, the rose-breasted grosbeak is uh, a very finch-like bird, um, and we sometimes group them up with finches. The, um, the females might look a little bit like a purple finch, um, but they're quite a bit bigger with a lot cleaner white, and the males have a beautiful bright red um, on their chest. The hummingbird, you probably know hummingbirds, and thankfully we only have one species of hummingbird in Michigan. Um, if you have a different species, that's extremely rare. It's only happened a handful of times in the state, um, but ruby-throated are common, so put out your hummingbird feeders and know, hey, I got that one in the bag. It's the only one species. <laughs> and last but not least, the indigo bunting is a beautiful bird that will come to seed feeders. Um, the females are all pale tan and the males are all a deep, brilliant indigo that just shines in the light. Uh, it's stunning. So if you're lucky enough to get one of those, um, hats off to you. May is the best time to try to see those at your feeder. Um, Oh, yeah, Zach says his, his grandmother's like, why do I have a blue cardinal? It's because it's an indigo bunting. Yes, they are really beautiful. Uh, just gorgeous birds. All right. Next, we're going to get a little quiz here, but I'm going to give you this guide and I'm going to introduce this group, which is by far and above the hardest backyard um, feeder group to get down. It's the LBDs, the little brown birds. This is what birders call them affectionately sometimes, frustratingly other times. The LBDs or the little brown birds are, are sparrows. And sparrows are a unique group that's mostly brown and streaky, um, all kind of in that smaller, could fit in the palm of your hand size for the most part. Um, and very similar because they just have so much brown and streakiness. But um, this image from Birdface by Richard Eden, um, there's also another really great one that's a little easier to find these days on the American Birding Association's website um, from Greg Neese. And it's showing you that their faces all look quite different. So here's a couple birds. And why don't you just see if you can figure out which bird is which. Um, if you know off the top of your head, don't say it. But if you use this guide and you don't know, go ahead and look and see if you can figure out what is bird A and what is bird B looking just at the facial pattern. Um, maybe we can do one together here. This one, uh, bird B, has a rusty cap, then has a very pale eye line, then it has a black eye line. I'm going to delete that so that I don't <laughs> make it too hard for you. And then it has a bit more of a gray lower part. So we've got rusty at the top, pale, dark, and then gray. Now look and see if you can find a bird that matches up with that in the face, bird face images here. What starts with rusty, then pale white, then black, then gray. And it looks like we got our first guest there from Diane and Jerry and the, everyone's getting it now. It is the chipping sparrow. Yes, this is the chipping sparrow. And it looks like Kenzie has gone on to try to attempt the second one. And that's a good guess there. So the second one is a, a really tough one, but one of the most common birds that might show up at your feeder. And this one is, it seems, all tan, right? But you do see it has a darker tan, then a lighter tan, then a darker tan, then all lighter 
light tan. And if you look on our chart here for what's all tan, well, the grasshopper sparrow is all tan, but it's a lot more stripes, right? And then the only other one that's pretty much all tan would be the female house sparrow, which is what bird A is there. So use this guide. I find it really helpful for those backyard birds and the sparrows in particular, and really concentrating on the facial patterns of the sparrows, when, especially when you're new at birding, can be a way to simplify them. You know, if you get a good look at that face and really document which stripe comes where. I used to so struggle with chipping and tree sparrows. You know, I just found them so similar until I saw this and was like, oh my gosh, a chipping sparrow has a white eye line and not gray like the tree sparrow. Um, so that took me a long time to get that. This is a really helpful guide. Hopefully you find it helpful too. All right, that gets us, I think, let's see, to the last group of backyard birds. We have just gone through almost every single backyard bird that you would commonly expect um, in a given, you know, any part of the year. And the last group would be our most, um, you know, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I call them the flying rats. These are our non-native birds, our invasives in some people's eyes, um, but certainly well adapted to living around humans. Um, the rock pigeons are basically the wild escape version of the previously domesticated <laughs> pigeon. Um, the pigeon actually has a whole book by a great author, Rosemary Mosco, um, where she kind of shares her love of the pigeons, which is really a resilient bird and is pretty much just found in urban and uh, farm areas. So other than being a nuisance, isn't really considered invasive. Um, the rock pigeon can come in a lot of different colors. They can be all white or brown. Um, but, you know, they're the only bird that really is going to look like a dove that's not a morning dove. Uh, <laughs> they, yeah, that's maybe not the best explanation. That's what I got. Uh, the European starling is uh, very common in agricultural areas and somewhat common in quite a few cities as well. It has a very uh, blackbird-like appearance, but very different body shape and a very uh, pointy bill. And then the house sparrow is definitely a common species. Um, it is kind of a conflict species because they do compete with um, bluebirds and can destroy bluebird nests. Um, and so there's there's some mislove for them, but they are another uh, very human dependent species only found around human structures, whether that's normally either um, urban areas or farms. Um, so yeah, those are our three flying rats and that wraps up our backyard birds. You know them all now. <laughs> okay, there's definitely gonna be more that might show up at different times of the year. You might get lucky or you might just be in a really diverse area. But I think if you can learn those birds, you're gonna have some of the major groups down and you're gonna be really prepared to start feeding the birds and identifying them. And that's gonna bring us to our second part here um, for today, which is feeding the birds. Ah, yes. So a few of you, I'm just going to call out to the, the chat really quick. A few of you noted I missed a really big group of birds that comes through in really big numbers. And that would be the blackbirds, the crows and ravens and grackles and red winged blackbirds. And just uh, this year and last year, we decided to move the blackbirds into our fall series, which we will have uh, in starting in September, October. We'll have a couple of quick fall ones so you can come back then for the blackbirds. <laughs> All right, let's get to feeding the birds. So first off, I want to start with what not to feed. There are a bajillion different bird feeds and bird feed stores and lots of stuff out there. It can be very confusing to navigate. And a lot of times it can be very tempting to go for that giant bag, a 25 pound bag of wild bird seed mix. That's only five bucks. Uh, but be wary of feeds that have a lot of barley, milo, oats, or wheat. I got this from Wild Birds Unlimited, which is a really um, a specialist store for backyard bird feeding. Um, and so they're going to be really knowledgeable knowledgeable and know what's what um, at most of those stores. Um, but they definitely recommend avoid barley, milo, oats, and wheat. Um, these are fillers that are put in that most birds will not eat and that some birds can eat and even um, get harmed by or at least not get much nutritional benefit from. And so avoid mixes that have these fillers in them. Um, you know, it might be tempting to go for that cheap mix, but a lot of that cheap mix is just going to end up on the ground, that wild bird seed mix. So those fillers are what you particularly want to avoid. It's not that all wild mixes are bad, just those that have too much of these fillers are not going to be great for your birds. What you do want to look at are things like sunflower seeds. So of all these, uh, all these feeds here, I guess, what do you think would be uh, the most 
popular seed of all these ones here. You, you got a lot going on, right? You have the corn, and that might be popular. You have the niger, the millet. But what birds are really trying to get out of seeds are uh, the inside part, and they want it to be nutrient dense, as nutrient dense as possible. And so the effort that it might take to crack open that seed needs to not be greater than the reward inside. And of all these, the one with the biggest, most juiciest reward, and a few of you have guessed it, is for sure the black oil sunflower seeds. Um, whether they're black, striped, or already cracked, um, your birds are Birds are gonna love these. These are the creme de la creme, the cream of the crop, the top of the top. This is what every bird is gonna want. On um, sunflower seeds, black oil sunflower seeds will probably attract the most diverse set of species as well as um, be most appealing to those species from any of these mixes. Now that's not to say these other seeds are not good. They have a lot of uh, good um, rolls and th birds will eat them as well. But the black oil sunflower is definitely, if you just wanna put one thing out there, that's what I would say go for because it's the most appealing because those seeds inside are super nutrient dense and those shells are very easy to crack. Now, safflower seeds are a great option if you have way too many squirrels or, you know, maybe too many blue jays and you're just not really wanting to feed all those blue jays and squirrels. Safflowers are a little more bitter and so squirrels will avoid them, but things like cardinals and grosbeaks um, will really love your safflower seeds. Now, I will say if you have sunflowers out and safflower out, nothing might touch the safflower. You might have to train your birds to go and love the safflower by kind of just putting those out for a while. Uh, but they are a really great um, alternative seed to try putting out. Millet is another common thing found in many seed mixes. And a lot of this will get kicked onto the ground by your chickadees or your blue jays. They're gonna push that out of the feeder and kick it to the ground. But a lot of your ground feeders like the morning doves and uh, sparrows, they're gonna like that millet on the ground. Um, although putting seed directly on the ground is not normally advised, um, birds will come and clean that up pretty quick. So, um, and you can always put those on a tray feeder too. And then um, Niger, that is going to be, well, actually, before I move on with that, so your sunflower, your safflower, and sometimes your millet, those are what you're going to put inside of a hopper feeder, like these two on the left here that you can fill up and, you know, just sit back and enjoy for a while because that seed's going to automatically refill through that hopper. Um, and platform feeders are also perfectly acceptable for any of these three as well. So those are the kind of uh, feeders that you're going to want to use for those kind of seeds. The Niger is a different kind of seed. And it's also referred to as thistle quite often. Um, and this is a seed that uh, you need a different kind of feeder for. They sell very cheap socks like this for a couple bucks. Sometimes they're already filled with Niger. And these are gonna be for your finches. You might notice that sometimes these Niger seeds get untouched for a long time, but all of a sudden a flock of siskins come in and bam, that's gone in a few days. So your finches are really gonna like these and it's a nice alternative to put out that's not gonna get eaten by some of your bigger birds or your squirrels or things like that. Although do be warned, if you leave that out and nothing else, your squirrels will eventually chew into there and get it. They'll get into any of it. <laughs> All right. And last but not least are corn and peanuts, which are often put into um, platform feeders. And peanuts, sometimes you can buy a specialty feeder for peanuts. These are really great because um, some birds like blue jays and black birds will love the corn. They will go right to that. And that actually might open up your sunflower feeders for your smaller birds, which I'll talk about in a minute. But corn can be a great additive um, to your bird feeding situation. But do know with corn that it can spoil within a couple of days. Um, so you need to be really careful about how much corn you put out. And when it spoils, it can form a mold that can make birds really sick. So you don't want to put a ton of corn out that's going to sit there and rot over a couple of days. You want to put out basically a daily or two days worth um, at a time. All right. So those are the primary seed feeds. Uh, and it, as, as we kind of alluded to already, feeder style matters. Um, each of these different styles can work for a wide variety of seeds, um, but corn and peanuts are often you need a platform feeder. Uh, and each of these styles can really appeal to different birds. I won't say anything's better than the other. It's really about maintenance and cleaning and uh, your own situation. So pick the feeder that works for you, but do note that there's a few seeds like the uh, socks for Niger and the platforms for corn and things like that that are gonna work out better. Um, also, wire cages work great for suet, which um, we'll get to next.
So the types of feeds that are not seeds, um, type of feeds that are not seeds, well, those would be things like your nectar for your hummingbirds. And nectar um, for hummingbirds is really quite easy to make. Um, do be wary if you're buying it. Oftentimes it has red dye in it, which is not necessary. Um, you can actually buy feeders that just have red glass, but the the dot, the, the nectar itself is not what's attracting the bird. It's attracted to the fake flowers that are on there. So um, don't buy the red dye. There's not really a lot of studies that show it's super harmful, but there's not really any studies that show it's not harmful either. So, um, you know, it, it's not a good additive. And the solution for um, that too, is if you don't want to buy the stuff, you just need white table sugar and water, boil it for a few, um, five, 10 minutes. Uh, and then it's good to go. Uh, it is important to note that you do not want to use organic brown sugar or you don't want to use honey um, because uh, hummingbirds are used to eating pure nectar out of flowers, which is just um, exactly rectified replicated through table sugar, through white table sugar. Um, that's what you want to use to make your nectars because it's a, the purest, rawest form of sugar. That is what the hummingbirds are adapted to. Brown sugars and honeys and syrups will be bad for them. So do not put those out. Um, just use that good old white table sugar, that beet sugar, probably made in Michigan. All right. <laughs> um, next is the suets. You can have all kinds of suet feeders. You can make, you can come in plugs or in cages where you put bricks. You can even make your own suets. There's lots of great recipes online. Um, suets do spoil a bit faster in the summer, so they're more commonly put out in the winter. But uh, most of those uh, blocks you buy from a store are going to last at least a few days up to a week in the summer. Um, and so you can still put them out, but you do need to monitor them closer in the summer. And this is what your woodpeckers are going to love. Your woodpeckers, your nuthatches, and a lot of your other birds will pick at it too. That fat, especially in the winter, is helpful for even the songbirds. All right. Um, Orioles love fruit feeders. And I actually bought myself one of these uh, Oriole feeders this past summer. It was really nice. Um, but before I had that, I just had some nails in some wood and then I jammed <laughs> some fruit onto the nails because fruit is what those Orioles really love, especially oranges and citrus. You can also put out grape jelly. Um, again, you just want to make sure that it's, um, you know, doesn't have too many extra additives in it. Um, but grape jelly can be great. And then, of course, like we talked about already, the mealworms are awesome for some birds that might never otherwise come to your feeder like bluebirds or um, a few other species like robins and um, even yellow rumped warblers and warblers will sometimes come to mealworms so it's it can be really fun but I will say a lot of birds like the mealworms so if you have starlings your mealworms are probably gonna be gone really fast blue jays love the mealworms everything's gonna love the mealworms so uh, it's always about a balance and they're a little more pricey but they're worth it if you can attract something new in all right, uh, so a few words of caution when it comes to feeding the birds, and I've seen some of these questions come through the chat. Do remember to put your questions in the Q&A. We might miss them in the chat. Um, so one of the cautions with nectar is to know that you cannot let it spoil, okay? So mold can form, and it's really important to um, clean your nectar feeders regularly. Um, it depends on how warm it is, but it can, in a really hot, days of summer, you may need to change your nectar every 24 hours or every, at least 48 hours. Um, in the cooler, uh, you know, evenings, sometimes that nectar can last longer, but the minute you see mold in there or any cloudiness, got to get that out of there because that can be harmful. Um, also, nectar should, like I already alluded to, should only be made with a refined white table sugar. Um, four to one ratio is, is common, although some folks do advise a three to one ratio earlier in the year. Um, it's a little more dehydrating, but it's a little more nutritious for the birds. And so anywhere from a three to one to four to one rate ratio can work out. Um, Another thing with suet is that come in many varieties, but fat on feathers can harm birds. So be careful to not let your suet um, kind of get spread out all over the place because it, if things like fat get on those uh, feathers, it can harm the birds. And as I also mentioned, suet can spoil quite a bit faster in the summer. Now, um, where to then, how to place your feeders? Um, <sighs> That is one of the biggest tricks with uh, birding in backyard bird feeding is where is it the best place to put your feeders? Well, that's going to really be somewhat restricted by what your yard is like. Um, but this is my backyard and that's why this photo is not very good. 
Again, I don't take great photos. <laughs> um, one of the things that you'll notice is that I have feeders at a lot of different elevations here. And that could be a great way to help open up your bird feeding to a bigger diversity of species and to help spread, a, cr spread out your feed so that different species can feed on different feeders. You'll notice I actually have a plastic bucket that I was putting some corn on and an old chair that I was putting some seeds on. I have a, um, a set of stumps that were wired together with some branches on it. And this is where I put some more, use these like platform feeders on top of the stumps. But then I also have my hanging Niger feeder here. And I normally have a hanging wire feeder with black oil sunflower here and my suet hanging. So those different elevations open up a lot of different opportunities for a more diverse set of birds. What I often find is my big flocks of blackbirds and blue jays come to these lower feeders where I add in the corn as an incentive. And then that leaves my um, wire feeder available for my chickadees. Um, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule by any means, but it does kind of open up those opportunities. Um, then the other thing you'll note too, is that I'm not too far from the tree. So placing your feeders not directly next underneath a tree, but maybe right next to a shrub or a, a small tree might be a useful way uh, to kind of, again, attract the birds by giving them protection that's nearby. But you wanna often place your feeders in short grass because this way predators can't hide at the base of them. So you won't wanna really put your feeders right in the shrubs or in somewhere where a cat or something could potentially um, wait at those feeders at the bottom of the feeder and pray. And the birds like to know that that feeder area is open, but they want it close to a refuge. So that can be a, a good kind of strategy is put it close to cover, but make sure that it's open exactly where it is. All right, now squirrels. I already saw some things coming through in the comments there. A lot of folks just don't really wanna feed squirrels. They wanna feed birds and that's understandable. We have two species, uh, well, actually three species of squirrels, I think in Michigan, um, we got the red squirrel and the gray squirrels and they can really be bossy and really make a mess of your feeders. Um, but you know, there's really no way to get them to completely stop. Um, we're not gonna watch this video today, but I think we'll share a link to it. It's a great video by a, an ex NASA engineer who tries to outsmart squirrels with a, a squirrel obstacle course, and you will not believe what these squirrels are capable of getting through. It's very hard to squirrel proof a feeder. It's nearly impossible. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things I recommend to think about is to just understand that squirrels will be a part of your, your feeding ecosystem. There's really no such thing as a squirrel proof feeder, although you could try. There are some that work really well, at least for a while. Um, but you know, one of the easiest ways to deal with them is to just provide alternative feeding areas. So just like I was talking about with that last slide, if you put your feeders in a couple different places at different elevations, this is gonna open up the opportunity. Maybe two or three squirrels will come to one section of your feeders, but then your other section of feeders will be open. Um, in, you know, If you have some things more out in the uh, open part of your yard, the squirrels may stay closer to, to the cover, whereas things like chickadees are, are brave enough to go out to the more open areas. Um, so again, placing stuff in different areas. That's, I think, the best solution. You could try the squirrel proof feeders. Be careful with using like fat or grease um, on a pole. Like we just mentioned, that can harm a bird's feathers. So don't use fat or grease on a pole um, or, or as, a, as a squirrel deterrent. Um, there are things too, like hot pepper oil. Um, you can get hot pepper suet cakes. These are, you know, somewhat effective at deterring squirrels. So yeah, there are lots of ways, but I think the easiest is to Know that you'll feed them, just try to get them to feed somewhere else. <laughs> um, there, are, there are a few other birds that some folks would rather not be eating their foods, um, mainly the starlings and the house sparrows. Um, again, uh, just advising trying a variety of foods, a variety of feeding areas. And if you really have a big mob of house sparrows or, or um, European starlings that you'd rather they move on, try avoid black oil sunflower seeds. Maybe just put out those staff flowers like we talked about. Um, and there are some species specific deterrents, these fishing line methods. It's often used to help deter um, house sparrows from bluebird houses because we talked about those being competing. Uh, but you can use them around your um, bird feeders too, as you see here, hanging like a halo effect of fishing line with weight on, weights on the bottom. Um, do just be careful, make sure you're not putting up something that's gonna harm our native birds, but those can help. All right, last but not least, before we get to our, um, our, <clears throat> our last bit of 
uh, Q&A here. That's what I was trying to think. Before we get to the Q&A, I want to really emphasize safety. So you've heard me allude to this already with nectar and suet, um, but seeds can spoil too, okay? So all of the things that you feed birds can potentially spoil. And so that's my first one. Watch out for spoilage, um, especially nectar and suet and corn, those spoil really fast, but seeds can spoil too. So if you've had niger seeds out for, you know, half the year, you really don't, you probably time to get rid of those. Um, store your seeds in dry areas too. If, you're, if your seeds are being stored somewhere wet, they can spoil. And beware of the snake oil, things like additives, dyes, preservatives, deterrents and repellents that might not be really that safe. Um, you know, just, just beware that not everything is as advertised <laughs> or it will be as effective as advertised or maybe even safe for the birds. So just be careful with those things. Um, when it comes to how often to clean your feeders, you actually need to clean them somewhat regularly. Um, and I will be honest, I, I kind of was not great about this in my younger years, um, but really feeders should be cleaned about every other week or so. Um, and in the winter, maybe you can get away with closer to monthly, but in the warm um, warm summer months, you probably would want to go weekly. And you just need to give them a quick gentle soap and brushing, you know, like using a bucket outside with a little water in it. That could be a great way. You want to use bleach for sanitizing um, because that evaporates away pretty quick and um, could be safe after after it's applied. Um, you, you also, besides cleaning your actual feeders, uh, it's good to take a rake and to get rid of the husks and leftovers that are on the ground. You don't wanna have those build up too much or that mass of, of dead shells on the ground or empty shells and other things can start to spoil over time. And, you know, it'll just be a bit of a nuisance. So it's always good to rake away every few weeks. Um, and if, if this is not super appealing to you, you can always try no mess blends. Um, these are gonna have a lot less shell left over. It's going to mean your feeders are super easy to clean. They probably won't have much on them. And these no mess lens, like this Wild Birds Unlimited one up here on the right, have all seeds that are already dehusked or deshelled. Um, and so it makes for real clean. It's a lot pricier, but you know, if you're just feeding a little bit, that might be a good option. All right. Um, I'm just going to leave you with some resources here. Um, so there's a, a relatively new bird book out called The Joy of Bird Feeding. If Backyard bird feeding is your passion and something you're really interested in, or you really want to try to get a diverse set. Like I said, some species people even try to keep the biggest yard list they can possibly keep. Um, this book, The Joy of Bird Feeding, is really helpful. Also, if you have a local store that specializes in feeding birds, oftentimes those folks can be very knowledgeable. Um, and then there are also uh, Facebook groups that can have sometimes helpful information, although not always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, folks, I hope you enjoyed um, this little rundown of what could be in your own backyard. I think the backyard is my favorite place to go birding a lot of the times because it's right there. It's accessible. And sometimes I spend on a college dorm room looking wistfully out uh, it's still able to see some species even from there and other times it's been with 20 yards in my backyard and having a huge diverse set of grouse and other things coming in um, but whatever your situation is consider feeding the birds but definitely also consider learning those backyard birds and you will be on to your birding adventures in no time